All right, so after a bit of hiatus, the Wavy Dynamics Insight series is back and we're kicking off this latest series of episodes with some talks about vehicle dynamics. I'm joined by my guest, Mike Law, who is a very experienced vehicle dynamicist. And over the coming weeks, we're gonna be releasing some short, sharp and concise videos on specific areas within vehicle dynamics. And hopefully we communicate our passion about the subject to you and you learn something along the way. But more so, we're just two engineers who enjoy the subject and, you know, will enjoy a discussion together. So I hope you guys enjoy what's coming. But Mike, nice to have you here. Oh, no, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Okay, so for this first episode, we're going to talk about the five key factors of a competitive race car. So I'm going to let Mike lead off with this subject and I will come in with some of my thoughts and, you know, we'll, we'll discuss it. No, thank you very much. So I'll often get asked in my job, you know, what are the important factors that, that you need to get right for a racing car to be competitive? And I think you can always trace it back to five key areas. And uh, these are the, the overall weight of the car, the power of the engine, uh, the aerodynamics in terms of downforce and drag, and also the driver you put in it. Uh, and why these five in particular? Well, I think for me, if you get a 1% improvement in any, any of these areas, you're likely to gain the most lap time compared to anything else that you can change on the car. Yeah, okay. So how do you generally approach developing a car in these five areas? Um, so in modern motorsport, the, the most powerful tool for that would be perhaps lap time simulations. So, um, you know, you would perform sensitivity studies to identify which is most effective in a certain um, situation. But that's quite an important element as well, right? Because um, the, the magnitude of each of these five factors and how they interplay depends on where you are and where you're racing, right? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. And uh, I think the answer to a lot of the uh, questions about where to prioritise can be best answered through something like lap time simulation, uh, one that is able to sort of ac accurately reproduce the area that you're struggling with uh, on the car. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. The, the the circuit and the the category of racing is very important. I think you know when when we talk about series like Formula Student FSAE the aerodynamics at such a low speed is probably going to be secondary to, to some of the other factors. But uh, similarly, you know, your high speed series, Formula One, uh, IndyCar, um, the, uh, the sports prototype categories, clearly the aerodynamics is, is going to play a much bigger part. Yeah, okay. So, um... For example, let's let's take one one situation where, for example, you identify um, the powertrain is the most important factor in in the race. How do you um, how what is a general approach um, to approach to take to develop that in terms of um, whether you start whether you would start to look at gearing, um, whether you start to look at overall power. So, I, I think when it comes to engine power. The, the key area where you're going to be limited by this is on the straights when your car's at full throttle. You know, there's nothing that you can do to the handling of the car at, at this point in the to your overall lap time. Uh, all, all you really care about here is, is the power of the engine, really, and, and, but also the, the force of aerodynamic drag on the car at, at that point as well. That's something that's going to be able to limit your uh, maximum acceleration. The and when I suppose when we talk about uh, engine, we we mean power rather than torque. Uh, I think there's a there's a famous Carol Shelby quote that is, uh, "Power sells road cars, uh, torque wins races," or or something like that, uh, which which is a, a nice quote apart from the fact that it's it's not really true. Uh, I, and and I say that because. Uh, if your car has a gearbox, then you can largely choose the amount of torque that you want to deliver to the wheels. Mm. 
but it's only by having a, a an engine with high power that you're able to sustain that torque uh, and therefore your accelerations at high speeds so uh, a good example of this i think is the the you know the screaming v8s and v10s that, that were in f1 uh, a few years ago they actually had had pretty low torque at the crank but because they they go through a, a whole powertrain uh, the uh, the torque that arrives at the wheels needn't be uh, anything like the, the the torque at the crank but all that power that you that you're able to generate by injecting so much fuel so quickly into your engine uh, that all arrives at the wheel as well and, and you end up with with very high for minimum lap time uh, and then I think when it when it comes to like the gearbox uh, this definitely has a part to play the uh, a seamless shift automatic transmission is going to mean more time at full power along the straights than you know manual manual stick shift with a, with a manual clutch yeah. uh, but I think the gains here are much smaller than just adding uh, 20 horsepower to your engine for example mm -hmm. yeah sure I, I've always and this is, I guess this is still somewhat of an open question for me, but I've always, there's a point at which, or there's an RPM at which the power and torque curves always cross, right? And it's inescapable. Mm -hmm. Do you have much of an understanding of why that is? It's like so, 5,252 5, or something, right? Oh, I, oh, I'm not sure about the, uh, I'm not sure about a number, <laughs> but yeah. I think the, the reason, uh, the reason they cross is that, uh, the the speed that the crank is turning is uh, is also a function in the power as well as the torque. So to work out the the power of your engine from the torque, you just multiply the uh, the torque that you get at any point uh, by the rotational speed at that point. Mm -hmm. And because the in your torque curve, uh, the engine speed is always increasing along x. You'll you'll reach a point where the uh, maximum power is delivered slightly above the maximum torque. So, going into the subject of weight and um, the the influence of weight into competitiveness. Um, so, key factors there are the the height of the center of mass um, above the ground plane. Um, then you also have things like the rotational inertia. Um, polar moments of inertia. Um, so the, the height of the center of mass influences the weight transfer that you get um, as you're accelerating laterally, longitudinally, but that also influences, um, or, or rather that is important because of tire load sensitivities and things like that. So the aim is always to have the lowest center of mass and that also is um, the same for the moments of inertia, right? You want the the bulky and heavy components of the car as close to the the center of mass as possible. Yeah, so so this is interesting. I think the your your primary focus is always to get the mass as as low as possible uh, in terms of kilograms, because I mean, so the the simplest model of a formula of a uh, racing car that that I often describe to people is is just Newton's second law, F equals m a. Uh, and in order to maximize acceleration in that expression, you need m your mass term to be as small as possible, because all the forces that act on the car uh, are gonna lead to lower acceleration if if mass is is big. So, if you have the choice, if your car is overweight worry about the total mass first before you worry about things like C of G or, or the other mass properties like moments of inertia, that kind of thing. The, uh, I suppose the, those, as, as those sort of secondary factors like, like C of G, absolutely. Uh, lower C of G is one of the only ways that you probably have available for reducing the weight transfer across the car. And uh, that's going to lead to uh, more, the, the lower your weight transfer, the more overall grip your car is going to have because uh, you're um, using most of the tire potential. The, the moments of inertia, I think, are, are quite interesting. 
uh, things like pitch and, and roll inertia are very important in ride performance. Uh, but again, they, they come a long way down the list relative to these sort of main five factors. Uh, and then there's a lot of talk about car your inertia mm. and how important it is to move uh, move things relative to the center it, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting problem because i think certainly the lower your inertia is is good in your sort of high your your change of direction uh, situation so low speed chicanes where you want to rotate the car uh, very quickly the the low your inertia is good there but when your car is is kind of close to unstable maybe more so in the high speed actually the higher your inertia can help to uh, just stabilize that phase prevent the car from uh, over rotating too much when when the rear breaks away but i i think the one of the important things to say is the 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 effect you can hope to have with your inertia is probably quite low uh, i mean we're never going to be able the the your inertia is is largely dictated by the the mass of the wheels uh, and you're not really going to be able to uh, affect it, you know, by orders of magnitude, let's say, by just moving your internal components of the car around. Right. Yeah. And generally they're packaged in the best way they can anyway. Right. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So all those effects, um, I've certainly heard and I, I kind of used that, that approach myself to classify them into like first order, second order, third order, etc. So if your first order effects would be um, overall mass of the vehicle, second order effects might be, um, you know, your inertias in your pitch roll. Um, what might some third order things be when you're talking about weight of a race car? So I'd, I'd probably put like height of CG above your inertia properties. Yeah. Uh, and I'd put iner inertia properties towards the bottom. One of the things, uh, one one of the sort of uh, mottos that um, I'll keep telling myself is is largely none of these things are important until all of a sudden they are. <laughs> so, uh, I, and I see them as as opportunities for failure rather than opportunities for success. I think, uh, you know, what you can you can design and and build a car that satisfies all of those big five. Uh, big five considerations that is is ruined by some other aspect that that maybe yeah. has been overlooked in the design process be it like overall weight of the steering is quite a good one uh, and the responsiveness to the driver when you say uh, or, when you say overall weight of the steering you mean uh, yeah so uh, just just how how much torque the driver needs to apply in order to oh, turn right. the wheel uh, and and the feedback that you get through the steering wheel, you know, if if you're not giving the information that uh, the driver wants in order to drive the car as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. then that's definitely something that that can hold back your performance. And it's you know when we talk about driver as one of these these big aspects, uh, you know, you need somebody who can maximize the 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 performance envelope of the car. Mm -hmm. uh, on every phase of every corner through every lap of the race, yeah. and if you're not uh, if you're not giving them the the information they need, then then they're not they're not going to be able to do that. Uh, but but equally, there there are plenty of things that can ruin the performance of your uh, of your racing car. But but getting them right isn't going to mean uh, you know a huge performance advantage. I think you know brakes is maybe quite a good example of this. Yeah. Uh, it, through the braking phase of the corner, you're you're limited by the grip of the tires rather than the the uh, than uh, the force from the brakes. Provided that you can you know your driver can apply enough force to to lock a wheel in yeah. that situation. Uh, yeah. But equally, if the brakes aren't working very well, uh, if the brakes are overheating, they're uh, they're not providing the bite you need mm. uh, you can find yourself you know quickly going backwards even if all your other big five aspects are correct yeah right yeah so it's really important to get them to get everything working together right so a holistic approach really rather than looking at things in isolation to look at yeah, how absolutely. everything 
you know interacts together and all these the subsystems yeah I, I completely agree with 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 the language you used and and it's i guess it's it's a proportional effort where mm. where you need to uh put your attention to designing the the, the fastest car you can uh it's no good you know going in with uh oh this this car is going to have the the best braking system on the grid and that's our our only performance goal yeah no sure um just revisiting um the driver and creating you know it, um a relationship between the driver and the car which is um conducive to you know ma- as you said maximizing the performance envelope how important do you, are things um in your experience like aligning moment to get them, you know, so they can get a good idea of um, the the grip levels going on at the front wheels and, and things like that. So the aligning moment is quite an interesting one because I th- I think this is, there's a, definitely a lot of opinions kicking around about uh, how best to give the driver the information of how much grip the front axle has. Mm. There's, I mean, there, there are schools of thought where, uh, you you just want the driver to feel the uh, the force of the front axle, and when when the the grip in the on the front axle drops away, you want that to be uh, felt as a drop of steering weight to the driver. Yeah. I think that the problem with that is that uh, no driver has driven a car that works like that the point of maximum torque through the wheel is actually slightly earlier than the point of peak front axle grip Uh, and that's just that's just an effect of of the tires and the pneumatic trail shrinking with uh, increased lateral force yeah so if you read uh like millican and millican's race car uh vehicle dynamics Mm -hmm. they'll tell you that the the drop of steering torque uh as is, is a useful cue for the driver and it allows them to kind of dial themselves into the feeling of the car and uh, and kind of get used to, to how that feels to them and, and then use that to tune how they respond to uh, through different cornering phases and, and things like that. So it's, uh, it's probably probably annoying but I don't think there's, there's one perfect answer to that. Mm. What what you could probably do is uh, the, I think the, the best approach is probably just to, to try and deliver what the driver wants to feel in each phase of the corner. And that might be slightly different between drivers, but yeah. uh, that's life. Yeah. And that's what makes, um, that's what makes things so interesting, right? Certainly from, for me, from a track side point of view, like ensuring everything meshes together, but um, from the, getting, I guess, getting, designing a car which um, has enough of a window that it can be tuned to different drivers is probably quite a difficult thing. (laughs) Oh, well, no, it's absolutely true. There's, um, Mm. you can, you can certainly find yourself in a position where the drivers want want to push in, in different directions. Mm. And, uh, I think you're, yeah, it's the job of the engineer to decide which of those directions to go in, uh, you know, whether whether you can try and favour one driver over another or whether it is possible to, uh, to split in direction uh, and try and satisfy the, the wants and needs of both of your drivers or, or more if, you know, especially in, in things like um, in sports cars where you've got multiple drivers driving the same car uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, finding a a balance for for each one is going to be very difficult. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we've covered the driver, we've covered weight, we've covered powertrain. So another factor in performance is tire grip. Stating the obvious, the tires are the only part of the vehicle in contact with the floor. So ultimately, every other effort you're making within the vehicle um, to improve its performance, it must. Um, ultimately manifest in the tyres. So it's very important to understand tyres. They are notoriously difficult to understand because they have so many non-linear properties which define 
their adhesion at any given time. Um, you know, they're constantly changing as they age, as um, the vulcanization process um, continues um, as they're hot. Um, they're obviously sensitive to temperature. Um, they're, as the, the, the volume of rubber in the tire decreases as they wear, that's gonna change their performance. Um, so there's a lot going on in managing tires and um, working with tires for performance. So um, what are the most important considerations in your experience in um, providing a positive environment for a tire? So I, th I think the, the first, uh, first consideration is if you have a choice of tires available, that you select the most appropriate for your, your application. And, and that can often involve some, some kind of track testing. But uh, maybe for things like the Formula Student Competition, uh, a, a bit of a look of the, uh, at some of the uh, tire curves that you get through rig testing is, is gonna be useful in the first instance. I think I think the important thing when it comes to tires is, as you've already said, and all all the forces that your car generates generates apart from maybe drag are transmitted through these tires. So uh, they need they're by far the uh, the biggest area that uh, that will influence your overall performance. Uh, and if I think if you want a good example of that, take a look at the Turkish Grand Prix in, in 2020, where the uh, F1 cars all turned up on a, uh, a brand new sort of smooth track surface in quite low temperatures. And the, the cars had, had hardly any grip at all. And lap times were maybe, uh, you know, 10, 20 seconds slower than the teams would have expected for a, a dry condition. And getting the getting having tires that are out of the window mm. uh, is a, is a much bigger penalty than say you know a small loss of, of aerodynamics or or maybe a, a small compromise on the engine power. And and that's to do with the glass transition temperature, right? So in that in that situation, they were below that transition temperature and very. Uh, so it it's probably hard to express in in simple terms like that, but certainly. Mm. The, the compound has a uh, has a temperature window that it's it's happiest operating in mm. uh, it, what you might find so some, something we used to find in our in our formula student car and in um, other other categories without tire warmers is going out and pushing on a cold tire uh, can can just lead to graining of that tire because the mm -hmm. uh, like you say the the tire is too brittle in that phase to to have a lot of energy going through it and it, and it just breaks up and falls apart. Mm. One of the uh, best things you can do when you're choosing compounds and what tires you're going to run uh, during uh, any particular race is to have a look at the, the temperature range that the compound is happy running in and compare that to how your uh, the temperature that your tires are reaching uh, as you go around a particular lap and and there's going to be some choice whether you bias that towards qualifying or your your sort of shorter runs or whether you you're biasing that towards uh you know race stints mm. and obviously uh, you know the the temperatures tend are tending to build through the race stints you know, through sort of constant wear whereas in qualifying you can probably target lower temperatures uh, in order to extract the, the maximum possible grip out of the tire for, for that one single lap. Yeah. And then, um, so there, there's a number of factors which I guess aren't so much in our control, um, such as the condition of the track, um, whether, whether it's dusty, whether it's um, well used and has um, you know, a lot of rubber on it. Wet is an, important, uh, is an interesting one. Um, so tires generate um, grip through two, two main mechanisms. Mechanical adhesion, um, which is just about how the track surface, um, you know, the, the peaks and valleys in the track surface penetrate into the rubber. And the other is chemical adhesion. 
And um, that is kind of as it suggests about the intermolecular bonds between the rubber and the track. And what things like water and dust do is interfere with the chemical adhesion. Um, so that's, uh, I guess, an important one to understand. Hard to predict, right? Hard to predict how, how all these things will um, influence these different mechanisms of adhesion. Um, so you're, you're largely, I guess, what you find out on the day and minute by minute. Yeah, of, of course. And as you, I think, pointed out towards the start of this, the, uh, the performance of the tyre is, is very difficult to, to understand ahead of time. It's a, it's a very complex modelling problem. For all the reasons that you talk about, the condition of the track can change, you know, a, a change of a, a few degrees of temperature, or, or as you say, if you've got uh, some, you know, dust covering the surface that, that just inhibits some of that adhesion, mm. uh, you're going to you're going to find it very difficult to model that. So, I, I think I think you're right. A lot of the time, you uh, it comes down to track testing. Mm. And, and choosing what what you think is best for the the track that you're on and also the car that you have. Yeah, so um, I guess, would you say most of that, you know, when you're getting to down to that much level of detail, it's empirical learnings rather than really understanding the, the um, physics at any instantaneous? I, I think it's, yes, it's, that level of optimization, I think it comes down to your your learning through testing on the day mm. rather than uh, but I think I think it, it, it's important to set that against the backdrop of the physics of the tire, you know, mm. and you can use that to to tell you when your uh, when your testing is is giving you a false read. Mm. Uh, you know if you've if you've got this this very soft compound with a, a very low operating window that uh, your driver thinks is, um, is is fantastic on a on a fifty degree track surface or or something like that for, for during a long run, mm. then you can you can use that to maybe guide how much you want uh, to uh, use that information in making your decision about what what uh, tire compound you should run, mm. rather than just accepting everything at, at face value of the track test. Yeah. And another, certainly in my research, an area which I find um, really quite interesting is, so tyres are viscoelastic, right? Um, mm -hmm. Which means they um, have elements of elastic behaviour and elements of vis viscous behaviour. Um, so what I find interesting as well is, it's not only temperature which has an impact on this, but also the, the frequency of the excitation into the rubber. Um, and that's, um, I guess something I'm still learning about, but, um, as I understand is almost entirely down to the actual track surface at a microscopic level, right? So these frequencies are in the order of, um, 10 to the five Hertz and that kind of domain. So yeah, at this point you're getting pretty deep into the, uh, tire science, hmm. uh, you know, and the, and the field of uh, trying to understand how the tire, how the rubber is is interacting with the road surface, and in, in order to generate the grip, mm. certainly it, your different track surfaces will have a different sort of surface content in terms of like the the uh, the roughness at sort of larger sort of uh, large stone scale. And also then at, at the very fine scales and to an extent you can you can predict how your tire tire compound is going to respond over different surfaces using things like your uh, your tire rubber master curves uh, that are a function of, of the compound that you've chosen but I yeah I think uh, that's probably going to take a lot more detail than than uh, probably the time that we have, but also yeah. my understanding of the subject as well. Yeah, and yeah, I guess that also brings us into the, the domain of hysteresis and, and how that all works, which is also very interesting. So um, for now, I think you guys are going to have to take that as a point to go and research yourselves. 
Um, okay, cool. So now I guess we're moving into the final area, which is aerodynamics. And um, certainly in a lot of the higher end series, um, motorsport championships, aerodynamics is um, one of the most important factors determining your competitiveness. Um, and so if we consider the body of the car as like an aerodynamic platform, it still has to travel and transmit its, its forces through the tires into the track. So there's a lot of interactions between the suspension and the aerodynamics. Um, so every, every car, every aerodynamic platform, as you'd say, has an area um, or a working area yeah, that is uh, sensitive to ride height and um, things like roll and yaw. Um, so it's, that essentially presents a window which um, uh, we want to place the car in um, in certain, cer certain circumstances. So the interplay there is really between things like suspension stiffness, um, which is why in a lot of cars you have a third spring. Um, that's about managing heave, um, which is something I think we'll probably talk about in later episodes. Um, but yeah, managing the aerodynamics of the car um, through manipulation of the chassis platform is something that we're quite interested in. Or, um, what are your thoughts and experiences of the interplay between the, the aero platform and, and the chassis? Yeah, so as you said, in cars that are travelling above a certain speed, the, the aerodynamics is, is clearly going to be a key factor. And this is a way of getting more uh, out of your tyres, largely, without adding any weight to your car, apart from what, what you need to add with, with wings and that sort of thing. So, it, you know, if you find your, you have the same tyres as your competition, but they're able to, to deliver a, a faster lap time, then uh, aerodynamics is, is definitely a, a, a sort of key factor in some of that. Uh, and and the, reason, the reason it's important is it allows you to, to open up the, uh, uh, exploit the tyre in a way uh, that isn't possible um, just through through kind of manipulation of temperature. Uh, it allows you to deliver more sort of in-plane lateral and longitudinal forces uh, because you've you've increased the the vertical load on the tire. Mm. Yeah, and, and these tires and these forces are, are important when you're you know in cornering below one hundred percent throttle. Uh, this is the area that that really delivers the the extra lap time. Yeah, and an interesting thing that I just wanted to note is that <clears throat> the um, the, co the coefficient of friction isn't a linear property. So, for example, um, if you um, if you increase the aerodynamic downforce by ten percent, for example, you're not going to get an extra ten percent of grip from the tire. So that that's uh, yeah, just an interesting point, which I think is. Um, and it's also why weight transfer is is so bad for your exactly. your car, because as you transfer weight and load up one tire. Uh, or, or one axle more than the other, the the grip, the extra grip that you get from that loaded tire isn't enough to compensate the loss that you'll see by unloading the the other tire or axle. So uh, weight transfer just equates to lower grip overall. Going back to your point about setup and how you you set up the cars, I think it, you know it's it's interesting to see if you look at a you know a Formula One car of today or a um, Le Mans hypercar uh, or, or other sort of sports prototypes, you can really see how the uh, weighting is towards aerodynamics over general ride or suspension performance. You know, the cars, mm. as you say, run very stiff. Uh, and this just highlights the, uh, the gains that you can get from the aerodynamics in running in that way relative to the, the losses that you'll see through the suspension system through through ride or something like that yeah it's uh it's it's you know it's been a natural evolution if you look at uh if you look over the history you've you've seen the the suspension travel and the 
importance placed on the suspension design just decrease and decrease and decrease all in favor of the aerodynamic performance uh, and yeah. I doubt that's something that's that's going to change uh, anytime soon yeah and that goes back to what I was saying about the aero map right so there, there's um and this is some of the the key science in designing effective aerodynamics is to create a, a wide window where um, you're you're maximizing your downforce so the the requirement is to keep the um, the ride height of the vehicle into you know within a certain window which means generally reducing the amount um, the amount of roll you see in the body, the amount of pitch you see in the body, and maintaining a very um, constant um, ride height at the front and rear axles. So this um, <clears throat> also opens the window into things like um, the kinematics, you know, anti-dive, anti-squat geometries and things like that. They're generally to maintain the, you know, maintain an effective um, or maintain an optimal operating uh, window of the aerodynamics platform. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right that they they run your car in for for optimal downforce, and the even if you're you know you're doing a pretty good job in other areas of the map, the the value of that extra downforce on on the grip of the tires pushes you into trying to stay as close as possible to it. So, you know, a, uh, a, a sports prototype or a Formula One car will have, you know, a huge amount more downforce than uh, your, you know, road going equivalent. But uh, even for, you know, if, with the same suspension travel as your road car, but the, the value of keeping the car within the, uh, within the aerodynamic, close to the aerodynamic optimum range is is so much more than uh you know being able to improve the ride performance of the car for example yeah which um i guess that lower speed tracks is quite an uh, quite a challenge right because you need um you know when you're spending more time in in um speeds where your aero isn't so um isn't so dominant you still have to maintain the the mechanical you know the compliance in the in the chassis to um to help you around the lower speed corners yeah absolutely it's, it's always a compromise uh, i suppose that the, the thing to say about low speed corners is whilst you're generating uh l less sort of total load from the aerodynamics in those corners the amount of time you spend in them and your sensitivity to to grip in that types of corners actually still keeps the emphasis on the aerodynamics you know mm. pretty pretty high uh, but again, kind of coming back to the point of nothing's important until it is, uh, the ride performance of, of the car can, can definitely upset a, a driver around, you know, those low speed chicanes and, and that sort of thing. So yeah, it's, it's, it's all a compromise and, and there's, there's no one handle that, uh, we can kind of point at and crank that can continue to deliver performance to the car because it, it always affects another area that that you also want to have control over yeah okay so on that note why don't we bring this episode to a close i think we covered a lot of um great information there and uh yeah i enjoyed the conversation i hope you did as well thank you for um you know i was going to say coming down to speak to her but it's uh you know offering your time to to have the conversation so i appreciate it no, no problem. Yeah, and um, as we said at the beginning, there's more episodes coming. The next episode will be on roll centers and performance. So stay tuned. This will be coming soon. Right. Nice. I will stop this.